Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the death of George Floyd and the call for greater police reform weighs heavily on lawmakers. A cooperative effort to aid small businesses is realized, and the lieutenant governor speaks about the future of art at the Capitol. All of this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. On the first day of the special session, Senator Jeff Hayden recalled the final moments of George Floyd's life, and the Senate paused for a moment of silence. At approximately 8.08 on May the 25th, Memorial Day, there was a call to the Cup Foods on 38th in Chicago, in the heart of my district. Uh, at about 8.14, two officers, Lane and Cooing, I might be pronouncing his name wrong, walked Mr. Floyd to their squad and tried to put him outside. Mr. Floyd stiffened up and fell to the ground. Mr. Floyd informed the officers that he was not resisting, but he didn't want to get in the back seat because he was claustrophobic. At 8.19, Officer Shavin pulled Floyd out of the squad and he went to the ground face down while still handcuffed. Officer Kuhn held Floyd's back while Lane restrained his legs and Chavin placed his knee on Floyd's neck. Mr. President, as we know for the next eight minutes and 43 seconds, Mr. Chavin did not take his knee off of Mr. Floyd's neck. As a matter of fact, a minute later, Mr. Floyd said, I can't bleed, breathe, please, man. A minute later, a bystander said, you got him down, man, let him breathe. Mr. Floyd hollered out, mama, mama, my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, please, I can't breathe. 822, officers call an ambulance, code two, no red lights or siren. A bystander tells the police his nose is bleeding. Look at him. At 823, Mr. Floyd said, I can't breathe. At 825, five minutes after an onlooker started videotaping, another bystander said he's not responsive right now. He's not responsive. At 827, the ambulance arrives. Shortly then, a bystander says he's not moving. A young man tries to intervene, but Officer Tao shoves him back. At 8.28, Shavin takes his knee off of Mr. Floyd's neck. At 8.29, he was placed in a stretcher. And as we all know, soon thereafter, after efforts from EMS, Minneapolis Fire, a lot of work being done at Hennepin County Medical Center, Mr. Floyd was pronounced dead. Days later, lengthy and tense debate ensued over five Senate proposals to reform law enforcement practices. A number of pieces of legislation have been written uh, to address police accountability. Both chambers and both political parties have written bills trying to prevent it, prevent that type of an event from ever happening again. And his sons are watching. They're watching what's happening in this chamber and in Minnesota at this point in time. It is not the time to be playing with rules and not debating the ideas that come from this body. So yes, maybe we intentionally had a bill to Senator Limmer's point that's only 12 lines, which the bulk of it, I can read it for the public to understand exactly what this bill does. And I quote, six million each year is to support and strengthen law enforcement training and implement best practices. Period. That's the bill. If we intend to change and reform the post board with training that, to Senator Ralph's point, works, three lines, if that, is not going to do it. It's quite insulting to read some of, the, some of the things here and hear some of these comments. Not so much to me uh, anymore, um, but to the officers that are out there 
that are doing the job that nobody in this room wants to do or ever would want to do. I occasionally let people know I was a correction officer. I've been in fights that everything goes. Everything goes. Your weapons go. Your shirts get torn off. You don't have any tools left. And you're in it for the fight of your, literally, your life. And to take away the one last opportunity for a police officer to defend himself or to defend someone who's helpless is just unrealistic. Well, George Floyd was me. George Floyd looked like me. George Floyd lived in, within my neighborhood. And those very police officers that you are saying are upholding the law, broke the law, sat on a man's neck for eight minutes and 43 seconds. Those very police officers that you said are there to do, to do this work are walking around choking people. So we're not taking away, in this instance, every tool that they need to defend themselves or to protect the citizens, what we're trying to do is to say that what is universally well known now, through Senator Dibble talked about expert after expert after expert, to say this is not okay. We went to talk to a dozen or so people from the black community to ask them directly, and I was surprised that they said they really hadn't talked much to their own senators. And so we wanted to hear, and they were grateful that we were coming down there to listen to what the people down there were asking. I was surprised that virtually none of them said they wanted to get rid of the police. That surprised me because the Minneapolis City Council, nine out of 12 members said, let's de dismantle the police. Not the people I talked to. You heard our majority leader saying he will go out to our districts and he will listen to people in our districts, but he doesn't have the need to consult with us. That is, as if I said, if, I, if something happens in rural Minnesota, I will selectively go to some places in rural Minnesota and ask people, I don't need to consult with the rural members that are here, because why would I? This particular bill was to request an updated comprehensive written model on the use of police force. In light of the death of a man who suffered a terrible death, I would have thought there would be a little more respect for him. Senator Limmer said, Senate is broken. I suggest, Senator Limmer, this country is broken. It's been broken for a very long time from my eyes. So for somehow today, things got a little tough and a little heated, a little testy, people got a little offended. Well, that's how I feel almost each and every day, Senator Limmer. Each and every day. And Friday, Governor Walls, House um, DFLers, so and other officials spoke at a press conference so to press for more police accountability and uh, reform measures. Time. We keep hearing that legislators in the Senate, that the, uh, that the majority wants to go home tomorrow. Um, Minnesotans want them to do the work. Minnesotans want them to do the work that has been put on the table. And today, you're going to hear a debate in the House that is going to be a real debate. As you saw on Saturday, seven hours of emotional testimony, seven hours of asking questions, seven hours of expert witnesses, and then coming back now to debate it and bring it to it. That is in contrast to the Senate's hearing that expert witnesses who have worked in the case of some of these folks for 40 years in law enforcement and criminal justice reform were given three minutes while they were interrupted during that time. No debate, simply brought to the floor. Um, that's not how the democracy works. A cooperative effort between the legislature and Governor Walls was realized this week with the creation of a grant program to provide economic relief to Minnesota's small businesses impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
$62.5 million to help small businesses hurt by COVID-19 was signed into law this week by Governor Walls. How will businesses benefit from this financial assistance? Well, thanks for having me, Shannon. This is a major bill that passed uh, earlier this week or last week and signed by the governor just uh, yesterday. Very excited about it. It is a uh, major uh, grant money that will go out to our small businesses across the state. All corners of the state will be eligible about, uh, for this money. So we're, we're very happy with that. So half of the money is for the Metro. The other half is for rural areas. Within that framework though, there are funds that are specifically targeted to micro businesses, to businesses owned by minorities, veterans, and women. What is the reason for the carve out of more specific people to receive that money? Well, we, this took about two months to work through all the details in this. And originally, every business, small business, has been uh, has able to demonstrate hardship when it comes to a result of the, the COVID-19 outbreak and the governor, uh, governor's orders for shutdown. But when, when we really got down to it, when you look at the data, those DBEs or disadvantaged business enterprises, they are the ones that have been impacted even more than others. And so this was a real request the governor and the house to really identify minority owned businesses, uh, women owned businesses and, and uh, uh, veteran owned businesses. And then really look at those micro businesses which are six full time employees and less. The primary grants are going out to small businesses with 50 employees or less. The, the, the carve out is about 30% to those micro businesses of six full time employees or less. Now, you just mentioned an important word. You said the word grants. These are grants and not loans. This is money that does not have to be paid back. So how much can an individual business get? How will they access the money? And how many businesses ultimately do you think will benefit? Well, with the $60 million divided, $30 million for Greater Minnesota, $30 million for uh, the seven-county metro area, approximately, so these are $10,000 grants. We're looking at about 6,000 businesses that will uh, be able to receive these grants. So it is, although it won't meet the demand that is there, the demand is tremendous, but I do believe this will make a significant impact to give those businesses hope uh, to get to, you know, another couple of weeks, another couple of months that will really make the difference because we need them to survive and thrive if we're going to have a good comeback here in the next couple of months. So the standard amount for any of these grants is $10,000. Is that right? That's correct. So $10,000. And again, it's grants, not loans. We talked to many, many businesses that have received many opportunities for loans. But again, you get into the small association and different situations where you're paying back loans. This is a grant. This is money that they will receive and they will immediately be able to put to use in paying bills and helping with employees, uh, different bills that have been backed up here because they haven't been in business. So huge for them to check that they can put into use right away and not worry about paying it back. So the distribution process is going to be a lottery. So not everyone will be helped, only 6,000. So what do you say to those people who aren't who don't win the lottery. Right, and this is gonna be a hard part. I mean, we, we, again, getting back to that supply and demand, we know the demand is gonna be tremendous. Uh, we probably only can meet about 6,000 of these small businesses across the state. I'm hoping that this presents a framework, Shannon. We work really hard with Commissioner Grove and his staff, uh, Kevin McKinnon. We work really hard, uh, Senator Pratt and I work really hard with Representative Robbins in the House and Representative Stevenson to create this framework to, for this bill to distribute this money. Now this is CARES Act money, so this is federal dollars that have been given to the state that we can allot, that this is a framework for uh, more aid to come. So even though we may not meet all the demand now, uh, those people that apply hopefully will be eligible for another round in weeks to come. So if the federal government passes more money in the CARES Act or more COVID relief funding, then that future funding could be funneled into this program. Absolutely. And that's my hope. And I know in conversations, this is if we can build framework and get it to a position where I would love to meet every one of those demands that needs it. Again, if our main streets don't rebound, uh, there's talk about 30 to 50% of small businesses not making an odd. That is 
be unacceptable for Minnesota. We have to have the backbone of our economy, our small businesses. If they don't rebound, uh, our communities, our state, our country, it all suffers greatly. So uh, my hope is that uh, the, the supply will continue to grow in the weeks and months ahead. Senator Paul Anderson, thank you so much. Thanks, Shannon. The Capital Art and Architectural Planning Board, known as the CAP Board, is scheduled to meet next week. I spoke with the chair, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, about her perspective in light of recent events. The death of George Floyd and the toppling of the Christopher Columbus statue on the Capitol grounds have prompted a reckoning in Minnesota. As the highest ranking Native woman in executive office in the United States, and also as chair of the Capital Art and Architectural Planning Board, you are uniquely positioned to shape how the Minnesota Capitol proceeds in acknowledging the contributions of Minnesota. So what do you envision? Sure. Well, thank you so much for that, that question. I think it's, it's really important to have a transparent and public and accessible process about the artwork that is displayed at the Capitol and on the grounds of the Capitol. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that I would um, not be supportive of putting the Columbus statue back up in that space. Um, but I also think, you know, it, at this moment, there's no sort of clear legal process for Minnesotans to request the removal of a statue from, from the Capitol grounds. So we talk a lot about the need to, to follow the process, and that certainly has been a theme. But what if there isn't one? Um, and, and so that's the work that's in front of us. And I think what happens next is a conversation with Minnesotans. And I am really eager to lead that conversation. Uh, I think the, the, you know, the, the statue of Nellie Stone Johnson and the, the process that we went through there was really exciting and based in community engagement. And she will be coming to the Capitol uh, just in the nick of time for us to be, be having these, these really important conversations about um, what it means for people to feel welcome, uh, seen, uh, and valued when they, they come to the, the state capitol or are on the state capitol grounds. Many view the Minnesota Capitol as a museum to Civil War history, but that history focuses primarily on the contributions of white men. You spoke recently about how very Minnesotan it is to take something that is offensive, namely the two paintings that were formerly housed in the governor's reception room, uh, Father Hennepin discovering the falls at St. Anthony and the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, and putting them in another room out of the way. The new display on the third floor does provide historical context and interpretation of those paintings. Is it a good solution? So I, I thought so at the time. And, and to be really candid with you, I was, I was part of that. I was one of the people who was interviewed and, and my opinions on both of those pieces of artwork uh, uh, hang there next to, next to the paintings themselves. Um, but we covered those paintings when that was our transitional office uh, uh, for the governor and I before um, we were sworn in because we didn't think that that the tribal leaders who came to, to talk to us or frankly my daughter or I needed to see those images um, without the opportunity for that deep interpretation. So I think now um, we're ready for a different conversation to say, uh, you know, is that truly accurate? Is that what should be displayed? Um, and I think Minnesotans are ready for, uh, for that conversation. And so um, it's time and things shifted. You could feel it dramatically with the, with the murder of George Floyd. Um, and this is our one opportunity to say uh, that, that we need change across all uh, areas of, of government, including um, how, how we gather uh, at the state capitol. So in the governor's reception room, there's those two blank spots now. What would you like to see go there? Well, it's the governor's reception room and, and not the lieutenant governor's reception room. So but as um, chair of the cat <laughs> board, like you will have a say. That's right. Absolutely. Um, I think it would be really exciting to have 
um, emerging artists, young artists, artists of color, indigenous artists um, who could display some of their work there. Um, it is a, is a place where people uh, should feel welcome. Um, and I think that would, that would be a, a really powerful thing to do. But that's also part of what this conversation will be about. Um, what should hang there? And, and I think Minnesotans should have a say in that. So as with so many things in life, we seek balance. Is it possible to honor the past as it has been portrayed to this point while extending historical significance to include the experiences and the contributions of indigenous people, people of color and women? So I think that's a great question and it's a really tough one and it is the question I think that we're all grappling with in this moment. Um, how do we create a space in the Minnesota State Capitol that honors the amazing things about Minnesota and Minnesotans while acknowledging and educating folks about some not so great things? How do we invite people to learn about the, the truly traumatic uh, history of the founding of the state without alienating folks who have been directly affected by that trauma and that history um, and folks who haven't been erased from the, you know, from the story in the first place? And how do we reconcile the fact that this is a place where people need to, to work and advocate for, for urgent needs and issues and a place where we should really be able to come together and dream and reimagine what is possible um, through the role of state government if it doesn't feel like a welcoming place or that there are accurate depictions of the people um, uh, who are, are standing in that building and are, are there to advocate for a future that, that they want for themselves and their community, um, then, then I, I don't think we're, we're getting it quite right. I didn't expect um, the, the role of the, being the chair of the CAP board uh, to, to really be um, uh, you know, very, so prominent in this moment, but I am really honored and humbled to be able to do this work with Minnesotans so that we can have these conversations, so that every child from uh, every zip code in the state, from every race and every background can walk in that door and feel the wonder and possibility of, of their own future and that we have to take, uh, handle that process with, with great care. And I, I'm ready to do that. And I think Minnesotans are too. Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, I wanna thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for this conversation. I appreciate it. Last summer, I spoke with the Department of Administration's Kurt Yoakum about the art and public areas of the Capitol's third floor, beginning with the Cass Gilbert Library. The library honors Cass Gilbert, who was the designer and the original architect of the Minnesota State Capitol building. St. Paul boy, got his start here in uh, St. Paul doing uh, smaller commissions, and then he got the Capitol Commission. And this really launched him into not only a, a famous Minnesota career, but a national and international career. After he got done with the Minnesota State Capitol building, he went on to do the Woolworth Building in New York City, the United States Supreme Court Building, and a couple other state capitals. We should note that this space right here houses the two portraits that used to, or two paintings that used to hang in the governor's reception room that have some controversy surrounding them. Mm -hmm. And now people can read panels that kind of explain that history. Um, how is this space used now? Uh, this space, along with a lot of other space on the east wing, third floor of the Capitol, and actually down in the basement of the Capitol, is now reservable by the public. Uh, as you mentioned, there's now 40,000 square feet of public space uh, in the Capitol. And you may remember as the Capitol was being restored, it was called the People's House and bring it back to the People's House. What does that mean to be the People's House? You actually have to have a place for people to come and actually uh, use the building for it to be theirs. And all this additional public space is, um, is part of returning the Capitol back to the people. And Cass Gilbert uh, Library is just one example. So you have a conference room, a uh, conference table right behind us that can seat people. You have another other uh, sitting areas, but it also gives a, a context to art of the, uh, in the Capitol. Like you said, the two paintings that had been considered controversial done in the governor's reception room were brought out, moved up here, but you have panels that actually interpret that, and along with other interpretive panels that really give some background to the art and other perspectives on how the art is viewed in the Capitol. There's also a gallery space now on this floor that houses uh, rotating exhibits. I've seen several of them. How are those exhibits chosen and how 
long do they generally last? Well, thanks for that question, Shannon, because one of the great things about all the new uh, public space at the Capitol is the opportunity through artwork to tell the story of Minnesota today. Uh, the, uh, the Capitol has always been, in some ways, a, uh, a showplace for art in Minnesota. And when the Capitol opened, it had some of the greatest artists uh, known in the country at the time doing art. And we have that opportunity with all this new public space to once again show, uh, showcase new art and tells the story of Minnesota today. Uh, the gallery is uh, the biggest place uh, for that. And what we have is we have a citizen advisory panel that makes recommendations for art that should be displayed there. They actually go out and solicit um, proposals from Minnesota artists uh, that uh, uh, and there's, uh, it's written in statute some of the criteria for uh, how the art should be chosen, but they make res uh, uh, recommendations and then that's forwarded on to the Capital Preservation Commission to give final uh, approval to uh, those exhibits. But it's really a citizen advisory panel that uh, helps uh, uh, choose some of that art. So as you mentioned, this area, this East Wing, is a good place to recharge your batteries or to meet with your legislator. But there's also a lot to learn in addition to this space with the panels um, explaining these paintings that are next to us. There's also room 316, which is a conference room that is reservable, but it explains the Muslim experience in Minnesota since 1880. Also in the hallways, there are panels that are describing the self-governing of the Dakota and the Ojibwe people. Why is it important to have those elements here in the space? You know, the Capitol is a very unique building. One, it's a working building. You have the legislature in here, you have the governor in here, you have the courts, and then you have all the people, plus the media all here. So it is an actual functioning, working office building. But then on top of that, it's a museum, and in a lot of ways it's also an art gallery, and all three of those uh, kind of components come together to help kind of tell the story of Minnesota and Minnesota's future and Minnesota's past. And to have the art exhibits that you just mentioned, it really does help tell the story of um, uh, Minnesota and celebrate the rich diversity of Minnesota. When the Capitol opened, again, we had some of the greatest artists in America at the time that contributed art to, uh, to the building, but they really contributed art from a, a very particular perspective. It really wasn't telling all of Minnesota's history and it wasn't really celebrating the rich diversity of uh, Minnesota. Uh, the exhibit that you mentioned, the tracks and snow, the uh, Minnesota Muslim experience since 1880, you know that's not something a lot of folks know that we've had a very extensive Muslim tradition and population in Minnesota going back to the late 1800s and it's a very uh, important part of Minnesota's culture. It's a great exhibit that's able to tell uh, uh, a little bit about that history. But in addition, in the hallways, as you've seen, uh, that there's the exhibit of why treaties matter, and that really tells um, a very extensive history about uh, the Native American uh, uh, population of Minnesota, their history, and their relationship with the state and federal government. When people come here, what do you hope that they'll take away? What we really hope that they take away is that this truly is their building and that they're not visitors here. It's their building, they own it, and we want them to use it and we want them to participate in what happens this building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.